Hello everybody and welcome back to part 3 on the extended dynamic mode decomposition. So what we have seen until now are a couple of things. First of all, we started with motivating a selection of a finite dimensional subspace on which we can project the Koopman operator. Right? This is what is the core idea behind EDMD, that we have the, the action of this Koopman operator, which can be approximately described by a matrix, so a finite dimensional approximation of this operator, when we restrict ourselves not to any function, but to this subspace that is spanned by a dictionary of function, and this this capital Psi. So, and then we had in the second video um, the key algorithm behind the computation of the matrix K, which is simply a multivariate linear regression problem from input-output data or consecutive time step data. But what we started in this lecture series was the motivation that Koopman operators are so helpful because we can use concepts from linear systems and apply them to nonlinear systems, in particular eigenfunctions and the decomposition into, into individual modes and, and their dynamical behavior according to the eigenvalues. Right? So this is what we see here, where we said that a Koopman eigenfunction phi is characterized by the fact that if we apply the Koopman operator to this function, then we simply get this function multiplied by the corresponding Koopman eigenvalue. And this video is about the question how to carry over this concept to the finite dimensional setting. Right? And so what I have summarized here and what I'm going to use now are these three equations. First of all, we have this eigenfunction definition for the Koopman operator. Second, we have the EDMD approximation, which means the operator is approximated by this matrix in a finite dimensional subspace. And then we have what we have seen in one of the earlier videos, um, the statement that if we restrict ourselves to this n-dimensional subspace, we can express a function approximately in terms of the basis functions of the subspace times some coefficients. And here I've picked the value xi, or the, the letter xi, for a particular reason that will become evident in a minute. So what this means is that if we have this basis, then we can hopefully express this eigenfunction in terms of the dictionary times the coefficients. And again, it's an approximation because well, we introduce a subspace. And now the question is, what are these xi's? And if we can identify them, then we're essentially done because this equation 3 allows us to approximately compute these Koopman eigenfunctions. And so what we can do is we can simply play around with all of these definitions. So I'm going to combine 2 and 3 for now. So what this means is we have, let's write um, the, the action of the Koopman operator not on an observable psi, but on some eigenfunction, which is k phi j of x. And what we see is that this is, for one thing, if we look at equation 3, this is the dictionary times these coefficients that are not yet known. And on the other hand, if we choose to uh, select the action of the Koopman operator on this, then we get this k matrix. Okay, So combining these two will give me psi k, and now not the a, because this is a coefficient for some arbitrary function, but these specific coefficients that are used to reconstruct this vector. So what I get is an approximate sign, because I need these two approximate equalities, which means I have this psi of x, and then the action of the Koopman operator in the subspace is my matrix. And then I am using these coefficients. So to make this more clear, what I've been using here is 2 and 3. Because again, the Koopman operator is in the subspace k, dictionary times k times these coefficients. And the third equation means that I have not used an arbitrary function psi, which is psi dictionary functions times this coefficient vector a, but psi the dictionary functions times the specific coefficient vector xi for the eigenfunction. 
All right. And then what we see is I have this expression and I can simply use equation number one to sh see that this is equal to lambda times phi, but we have equality signs here, right? So uh, uh, approximate equality signs here. So what I'm getting is approximately lambda and now the jth lambda because I'm considering the jth eigenfunction phi j of x. Right? And so to be clear, this one is simply the definition of my, my Koopman eigenfunction. And now there's one step left um, to get back to the finite dimension of the world. So what you see here is the eigenfunction phi j. And I can again simply use the third definition that this can be approximately expressed in terms of this dictionary times the coefficient vector. So what I get is approximately lambda j times this dictionary psi of x times the vector psi j, okay? And again, just to be sure, this is equation three I've used, okay? And so what is really interesting here is the fact that we can now relate this part with this part just in an approximate manner, but still, okay? So what we see is we have the, the lambda can be shifted in, so I can factor out the psi. So what I'm left with is k times psi is equal to lambda j times psi j. And now this is really cool because what you see is that this is simply an eigenvalue problem in finite dimension. Right? And this is nice because we have computed this matrix using the EDMD algorithm as in the previous video. And now we can compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix K in dimension n. And what we get is a simple rule, equation three, that allows us to compute the associated eigenfunctions. So very, very nice, right? So we get the K matrix, but we also directly, by the eigen decomposition, get the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, right? And so this is beyond the scope of this video, but what you can also do is you can circumvent explicit calculation of this K matrix, which can be very large, but you can do sorts of tricks like singular value decomposition to four dimensionality reduction or kernel methods, which we are going to consider a little later to avoid computing this large K matrix or you know, rewriting it so that it becomes smaller in dimension. But anyway, solving this finite dimension eigenvalue problem gives us the eigenfunctions and the uh, Koopman eigenvalues, which is now really, really nice, obviously. Okay, and so before we look at this in terms of a short video or the, the, the code here um, and, and, and some plots, we can now consider again what we can do with alt, uh, arbitrary observable functions, not just the eigenfunctions. So if we look at any observable psi again, then what we can do is we can simply use what we have learned to express any observable function in terms of the Koopman eigenfunction, the Koopman eigenvalue, and what is known as the Koopman modes. This is what we will cover in the next video. And we will see that all of these can be s obtained by simply solving this finite dimensional eigenvalue problem. Okay, so let's simply use the definition of the Koopman operator on any function psi and what we see is that we can, again, this is what we've seen before, right? We can express this as a linear combination of the eigenfunctions, right? So psi can be expressed by a set of eigenfunctions. Um, so this is the sum k equal to 1 until n coefficients vk times phi k. of x, 
Yeah, so let's put a bracket around this. So this is now I'm replacing psi by a linear combination of eigenfunctions. Um, and what you see now is that I can simply plug in or shift around because, you know, the Koopman operator is linear, we can shift, take out the sum. And so what we get is the sum k equal to 1 until n, vk, and then the action of the Koopman operator on the individual eigenfunctions phi k of x. All right, and now what I can do is I can plug in my definition of the eigenfunction so that I simply get the eigenvalue, and this gives me in the end the sum over k from 1 to n vk times lambda k times phi k of x, okay? And so what we see here, this can be computed using our definition here. So it's based on my dictionary. Um, psi k. And this is what is known as the Koopman mode. This is until now unknown, but we will cover this in the next video. All right, but here you have it. It's a complete procedure using the definition and then the EDMD algorithm for this matrix approximation. All we need is to define a dictionary of basis functions, right? A subspace that is spanned by these functions. And then we get a matrix that approximates this operator. And using the eigenvalue decomposition, we can express any the action of the Koopman operator on any observable simply by a linear combination of eigenvalues multiplied with these eigenfunctions, right? which are again the dictionary times the eigenvectors of my finite dimensional problem. And what's left to be computed is these Koopman modes to really reconstruct. This is sort of the, the combination or the, the coefficients of the relative importance of these individual parts. Okay? But before we go there, let's have a small look at some code. And we are going to consider the duffing example once more that we have seen before. Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm defining this dictionary psi using radial basis functions or thin plate splines, uh, thin plate RBS. So what we're using is, um, well, I'm using 1,000 of these radial basis functions and I'm going to add the constant function, so 1,001 entries. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the entire data set and place these RBFs sort of equidistantly using k-means clustering. Okay, so what I'm calling here is just a k-means algorithm to give me 1,000 centers. I, I'm having a plot, showing a plot in a second. And then I'm using these uh, 1,000 centers as my basis functions. And what the thin plate spline does is simply um, it computes to this function, right? It's sort of a, a function based on the distance between a point and the center, similar like classical Gaussian RBFs, let's say. Okay, so this psi function simply takes an input x and loops over my 1000 RBFs and computes simply the distance between the input value x and the center. And then as the thousand and first, but it's entry one, I'm using the constant function. And so this is my, you see here, that this is the distance and then we have this formula for the, the thin plate um, RBF. Okay, so 1001 dimensional dictionary. Here's a plot. Um, it's not so easily visible, but it doesn't really matter. So the white dots are all the samples that I'm using for training, it's similar to, to what we had in the video before. And then we have these red small dots, which are the 1000 centers um, obtained using k-means clustering. So these are the fixed centers, and I'm computing for every point the, the distance between the, the white dots and the red dots, let's say, for every point to, to every dictionary. All right, so once we have this, we can simply use the Koopman operator or the EDMD algorithm to approximate the Koopman operator exactly as before. So x is my, my time series data, y is the same time series data, only shifted forward in time, one time step under my flow. And this is the, the, the linear regression problem that I'm solving to get the matrix k. And I'm now computing the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this k matrix. Um, and then I'm just sorting them according to um, how large they are in, in, by the real part. 
So what this means is I will consider the, the, the rightmost in this plot first, and then the, the, the smaller the, the, the real part becomes, the, this usually means the frequency increases because the, the complex part increases. So it's just some sort of ordering, let's say. And what we can do now is we can simply compute the eigenfunctions or evaluate the eigenfunctions on a certain grid. So I could also use the data points that I have. I will do this in, in the second part of the code here. But I can also simply evaluate this equation on a finite grid. And this is what I'm going to do to show um, a nice equidistant visualization. So what I'm doing here is I'm introducing a grid that goes from minus 2 to 2 in both dimensions, and I'm computing the first 20 eigenfunctions. And so what I'm doing here is simply xi, the, the kth eigenvector. Again, uh, I've transposed the things because my dictionary is as a column vector, whereas the standard definition in EDMD would be that this is a row vector. Okay, so um, don't worry about the transposed here and the, and the switching of the signs. This is exactly as we had it before. So it's the xi vector times psi rbf, exactly what I have here. One thing though, I'm only considering the real part because, you know, eigenfunctions can be complex valued. I'm using for the visualization later the real part only, but this is my personal choice. We will have other videos a, a little later where I can visualize the complex part as well when it comes to kernel EDMD. Okay, so simply go over the grid and at every grid point evaluate the first 20 eigenfunctions, which is exactly formula 3 in my plot here. And so what I'm showing here is these eigenfunctions, the leading ones. And as I said, I'm, I'm only visualizing the real part because I, I chose to, to compute the real value only here. This is my personal choice, doesn't have to be. So this is the real part of these eigenfunctions. And what is very interesting to see is that the function with um, eigenvalue 1, which, uh, one, which means it's, it's a constant over time, gives me a nice separation between these two basins of attraction. And let's, I'm going to try to visualize this a little more. So you see there's a clear distinction between the two halves. And we have seen in the previous videos that these trajectories spiral into the left part and the purple one, or here in the, in the yellow part, um, depending on where you start. And so clearly these eigenfunctions give us a notion of, you know, basins of attraction and allow us to separate state space. Okay, so some of them follow and you see a more fine-grained separation. But for the purpose of this video, let's just consider the very first one and study uh, what we can do further with it. Okay, so what I'm doing in the next part is I'm splitting my data set according to, well, one half, and the other half, so I normalize between minus one or zero and one, and I make a split at 0.5. And what you see here, so wherever the eigenfunction is larger than 0.5, I'm taking this one, and the other one is plotted here. So you see a clear separation of these two basins of attraction, and you see I've plotted a few trajectories so that you see that they do not leave this basin of attraction. So you see one is starting at the, excuse me, at the very top, but it's spiraling around and then, oh, excuse me, this one apparently goes in here, right? But this one is starting here and it's spiraling around this one until it goes here. So you see a, a, a nice separation. And what we can do now is, and oh, by the way, this follows very nicely the paper on extending dynamic mode decomposition. I will put the reference into um, the comments. It's the same reference I've used in, in the uh, parts before on EDMD. So I'm repeating the exact same calculation, but I'm only using uh, half of the points now. So I'm restricting my study to one basin of attraction. All these red crosses are the fixed points, by the way. So you see these are stable, this spirals in, and this one is where, where is this? this is unstable and, and points leave this point. Okay, so I'm doing exactly what I did before. I'm considering only half of the data. Now this is the f that is attracted by the left um, stable fixed point. And I'm doing the exact same thing. So I'm defining a new RBF dictionary with half the number because I've only half the samples, but otherwise it's exactly the same. So same calculation using linear regression, 
same solving of the eigenvalue problem and then computing the eigenfunctions. Here I'm not bothering with you know doing this on a grid but I'm using the points I have. So it's psi of the, so the eigenvectors times my dictionary evaluated at the training points that I already have. And what you can do now is you can try to compare the eigenvalue spectrum that you found with what we know. So it's well known that the uh, eigenvalues of the linearizations, and this is the eigenvalue of the, the, the fixed point on the left, that this should be contained in the Koopman spectrum. So what you see here is that we have a close match of one of the eigenvalues, the, the green one, that matches very nicely with the red, the, the analytical solution of the linearization of this fixed point. And now we can compare what this eigenfunction tells us about the dynamics of this fixed point. So what you see here is the corresponding eigenfunction, real part and complex part, or imaginary part, or rather this is the, excuse me, this is the absolute value, and this is the phase. And so what you see is that this is sort of a basin of attraction that goes into the fixed points. And here you see this phase shift that tells us a circling around, so a spiral in dynamics. And so here's a hard shift because it's just a 2 pi periodicity, so it sort of goes around. Okay, so this concludes our rather lengthy derivation of how to compute eigenfunctions in the EDMD framework. But I hope that the, the code and the visualization helps us to understand why this is so helpful and allows us to use eigenfunctions to study nonlinear systems. So thanks a lot for your attention and we are going to wrap up the EDMD part in the fourth video where we are going to discuss the Koopman modes and have a summary of the EDMD algorithm. Thanks a lot.